I believe that the young people need to know their history. They need to know what this church is about. They also need to learn the sacrifices that the founding fathers of our church made so that they can have the privileges that they're enjoying today. The history of the Free Presbyterian Church is best summed up in the words of the Reverend Duncan Campbell. Describing the Isle of Lewis revival of the early 1950s, when the river of God's grace ran with such force that nothing could withstand it, he said, God came down. Around the same time, in Ulster, God most definitely came down. And those who witnessed the power of his works could but look on with amazement. He came down on a few stalwart men in cross gar and gave them courage to withstand ecclesiastical coercion. He came down on a little tin hall and on a gospel mission and brought many into the kingdom of his dear son. He came down on a young evangelist, anointing him with power to proclaim the riches of his grace. He came down when government conspiracy imprisoned three faithful preachers and turned the tide of public opinion in their favor. He came down again, establishing gospel beacons in towns and villages all over Ulster. Today, the same light that inflamed those beacons beams out at home and abroad. It shines around the shores of our island home and in lands across the sea. It shines on the mission fields of Africa and in the heartlands of North America. On the English mainland, in the Welsh valleys and in the Kingdom of Knox. In the great dominion of Canada, and away down yonder in Australia, beneath the Southern Cross. In all these diverse and distant countries, and in many more, the Gospel witness begun in a tiny county down village still proclaims the greatest message ever heard. Jesus saves. Yes, to the honour of his name, and to the wonder of his people, God came down. The Free Presbyterian Church was born in adversity, when a local congregation in a tiny rural village was prevented from using its own property for a gospel mission, a spiritual warfare began. Well, as I stand here today, I feel very, very humble. Uh, that God should have used me as the instrument to preach the first sermon on this very site and to declare war on apostasy, a war on the darkness of Romanism and the deception of popery, war on every anti-Godism about the country and to raise the gospel standard of truth and righteousness grounded and founded upon the word of God. It was 1951, and in Crossgar, County Down, elders in the local Lissara Presbyterian Church wanted a young evangelist, Ian Paisley, to conduct a gospel mission in their church hall. However, the church hierarchy had different ideas, and when they met as the Presbytery of Down, they forbade the use of the church hall and suspended the local elders. After a few preliminaries, they said that they couldn't give us the hall. They wouldn't give the hall. So they lined us up and they asked us, asked me for saying it was Adams. They started off alphabetically. Do you agree with us? I says, no, I don't agree with you. So they were around all the session. And uh, there was a bit of a, I think they got a shock, more or less, the press, but they didn't think there'd be any objections, you know. So they sent us into the body of the church again. And we come in again into the vestry, 
Well, what's the verdict? Well, I says I'm not changing. I says, I still say no. Well, they said to me, you've been an elder, that'll, that'll mean you being suspended as an elder. And I says, when will that suspension take place? Does it take place now? They said, yes. And I said, good night, and I moved, and that was it. That's what I was suspended for, saying no. Evangelical people felt that they had a difficulty in many congregations. This was true in Lasara, where the intention was to have uh, a born-again man in the pulpit with uh, an evangelical aspect to the preaching. But it seemed to the local people that those who had the say in matters, namely the presbytery and other influential people as well, uh, arbitrarily closed the door on evangelical men. I think that because of the reputation that uh, Mr. Paisley had in his opposition uh, to noted uh, church leaders, that when the Down Presbytery heard that this man was coming to preach in their property, uh, they uh, were up in arms, they overruled the session, and uh, they refused to allow him to come in uh, to preach the gospel. The mission went ahead in a different venue, and many souls were brought to Christ. When it was all over, another problem arose, where to send the new converts. The elders, who by this time had resigned, weren't going back to the church which had spurned them, and they couldn't send the converts there either. In a way, it was natural for the work to be Presbyterian, since the men themselves would never have seceded if they hadn't been subject to repressive measures. They didn't really have a desire in themselves to leave the Presbyterian church. Uh, it was really a succession of events, all of them disappointing, all of them obstructive, they felt, uh, to the proclamation of the gospel in that area. So matters did come to a head, but they never deserted the Presbyterian principles. The only solution was to form a new denomination, Presbyterian but free, free from the dictates of men whose passion for souls was gone and whose only interest was the denominational name. About 90 people were saved at those meetings. So there was a tremendous stirring in that part of the country and a real move of God. And the outcome of that was the formation of the first Free Presbyterian Church. And when the Free Church was formed, I was down at the opening in Cross Gar, and I realized that this was of God. I just felt immediately here was a move of God. Here was going to be a Presbyterian church that would exalt Christ and stand on the great doctrines of grace and the great principles of our Protestant heritage. And I immediately joined right away. On St. Patrick's Day, 17th of March, 1951, the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster was constituted in Crossgar, in the same little hall where the mission had been held. In a little while, other opportunities were to come. There were feelings of discontent. Uh, a crisis would, uh, would develop elsewhere. And in quick succession, as it turned out, one opening after another came. But I'm not prepared to say that was part of a plan. I, in fact, I don't see it as a plan at all. I, I feel that it was an emerging or a developing situation, and, uh, and as I have said, the situation at Crossgar was merely symptomatic of how others felt in different parts of the country. So there was uh, something waiting to happen. And things did happen elsewhere. First, near Balamoney in North Antrim. Well, uh, it all began with a wee, a wee bit of trouble in the church we were in, and they uh, thought in having a mission, and there was great talk about uh, Dr. Paisley being a very evangelical man and a good pre and a good preacher, and they thought they would give him an invitation to come and have a mission. The mission was held in an old schoolhouse at Cabra, a few miles from Balamoney. 
So Mr. Paisley came down, he got large posters put up uh, advertising the mission and also what he was going to preach on. Three men going to hell, all living in Ballymoney District. Mr. Paisley knew how to gather a crowd. The first night of the meeting, the place was packed like sardines and there were many people outside the sun side. And uh, the preach was great power. There were a hundred souls saved at that mission. After the mission, the same question that confronted the people of Cross Gar, whether or not to form a new church, had to be faced. To be sure of the right answer, a night of prayer was held in the home of Sandy Macaulay, later to become a stalwart of the new church. Wally Stevenson was very, very keen to go on to the church. Uh, Wally's sister was saved, wonderful conversion. And uh, Wally was very keen we should go on. I remember standing on a mat in the front of our uh, fireplace, and Wally says, Well, he had to take more stand. And my father got a promise in Job 8 and verse 7 Though the beginning shall be small, yet the latter end shall greatly increase. And uh, on the strength of that verse, at seven o'clock in the morning, standing out near our front lawn, we decided to go ahead with the church. By this time, the use of the old school had been withdrawn. So the church was constituted on a Saturday afternoon in a field beside the old school and in a tent. Next day, it rained, and the morning service was conducted with the congregation sheltering under umbrellas because the tent was rather leaky. For the evening service, a quick move was made to Willie Stevenson's barn loft. Wonderful times up in that barn loft. The singing was something that was to be remembered, and we had powerful times of blessing. And the people who were joining in that place was packed to capacity every Sunday night uh, here in the Gospel. In Rosharkin, County Antrim, there was a split in the local Presbyterian congregation, and about half of the membership decided to leave. They converted an old barn into a makeshift meeting house, set planks across concrete blocks for seats and gathered for worship. They also invited the young Ian Paisley to address them. And I can remember when the service was near finished, he made an appeal. He says, I'm leaving it with you. You can be whatever type of a church you like, a free Presbyterian church, an independent church, congregational, another Presbyterian church, you can be whatever you want. He says, I'm leaving it with you to make your own decision. The congregation decided that morning there would be a free Presbyterian church. With three new congregations now established, Dr. Paisley's own church, known as the Ravenhill Evangelical Mission Church, decided to join forces with the new movement. And after a vote of the membership, Ravenhill Free Presbyterian Church came into being. So why form a new church? To answer that question, we have to ask and answer another. What is a church? Well, first, it isn't just a building. Indeed, it's not a building at all. The building should more properly be called a meeting house. A true church is a fellowship of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ a company of people with like beliefs and spiritual ideals, a group of people who worship together and work together for the extension of Christ's kingdom. I was condemned. I was without hope in the world. And in the world to come, I justly deserved hell forevermore. But Jesus paid it all. Then again, a church is a proclaimer of the gospel. It has a message for the world, a message of hope, of deliverance and of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. As I come to worship this God, I am coming to a God who provided eternal salvation for me in the person of his Son. I bow my head in humble gratitude, 
giving God the adoration of my innermost being and thanking him for such deliverance and mercy. I'm a child of the king today. Finally, a church is a defender of the faith. It upholds the truth against all attacks, whether from within or from outside. I can remember, uh, I think it was in 1950, uh, that Dr. Paisley produced this leaflet uh, on the teachings and beliefs of Dr. Leslie Weatherhead, who was at that time the president of the Methodist Church. He was on a special visit to the church in the centre of Belfast, and he got this leaflet in which he gave his quotations of Leslie Weatherhead, how he had rejected the virgin birth, how he had uh, abandoned the blood atonement, and how he had spurned the fundamentals of the faith. We went down on the morning uh, that uh, he was to preach, and we distributed these leaflets. The title was Leslie Weatherhead Speaks of His Religion. And so when we offered these leaflets out to people, they thought that we were there to promote Mr. Weatherhead, and they received him very gladly, uh, very happy to do so, very pleasant, smiling and so forth, until they opened them. And then once they opened them and realised why we were there, then the whole atmosphere changed. And many of them came back and tore them up before us and threw them at our feet. <laughs> Presbyterians in Ireland have a long history of defending the faith, going right back to the mid-1800s when Dr. Henry Cook purged the Church of Arianism, which denied the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Christ. This effort to dilute the true gospel was roundly defeated and the Church was cleansed from heresy and error. What does it say? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So I have to go out and reprove them. And that is a, a work that has to be done, the reproving of evil. In a sense, it was another attempt to deny the gospel to the common people, which led to the events in Cross Gar in 1951. The elders of Lysara decided that they would want a church that would preach the gospel, that would have the spirit of evangelism and would stand for the truth and oppose apostasy. Begun in battle, it would be war for years to come. There can be no doubt that once the church was founded, there was very, very bitter opposition to it from many quarters. The apostate denominations were incensed and uh, despised it and hated it. Uh, but the thing that amazed me as a young believer was the attitude of many evangelicals. I suppose that the church itself was a, a testimony to their compromise in apostasy. And I can remember an aunt of mine uh, who went uh, to a Presbyterian church and their minister visited them some time after the free church came into existence. And she thought that uh, she would ask him his opinion, what he thought about the Free Presbyterian Church. Now this man was a born again believer, at least that's what he professed. He was a noted evangelical. His answer was that the Free Church was of the devil and every minister in it. And my aunt looked at him, well, she said, I have two nephews and they are ministers in that church and I would not class them as of the devil. To be a free Presbyterian, or Paisleyite, in the 1950s and 60s was to be considered odd at the least, maybe a bit extreme, possibly a troublemaker, but definitely not normal. A noted minister who was an orange man and purported to be a saved man when he was asked by another minister of his own denomination regarding the Free Church, if there was a Free Church in his district, 
He said, it's getting to be that there's a sewer now in every town. The church was continually misrepresented by the media. Its ministers were pilloried and abused. Its members ostracised by family and friends and scoffed at by workmates and employers. You can be a free Presbyterian in Ulster today and you're not persecuted. But in the early days, people who joined the Free Church were put out of their homes. Uh, they lost their jobs. Uh, they were counted as the off-scouring of all things. We rejoice in the privileges we have in the Free Presbyterian Church. There are great buildings we can use, uh, many young peoples, many congregations. But we need to remember the cost of the early founders of this church. They sacrificed. Sometimes they sacrificed friendships. In other words, there was a stigma to becoming a Free Presbyterian in the early days. We were hated. We weren't liked in the village. And we gained a nickname and were called the Barn Rot. Everywhere you went, you were called a Barn Rot. But that made no difference. The Lord blessed and the Lord saved souls. They sacrifice financially. They give of their time and effort so that this denomination would be built. So that young people sitting in a comfortable building could have that building. When you were involved in, in open air meetings, uh, the hostility of people came through in many instances. I can remember a time uh, we were holding uh, an open air meeting in Balamuni. Uh, it, was, it must have been in the, near the centre of the town because Dr Paisley and, uh, uh, and the Reverend Wiley were uh, at the back of this lorry and uh, John Douglas and I, while the other men preached forth and uh, lambasted the apostasy, they sent us out uh, to give out tracts uh, amongst this uh, rather hostile crowd. The ministers on the lorry were like in Fort Apache and they sent us out among the Indians to give out tracts because uh, when I went up to one man, he looked at me and he was an old farmer. He said, uh, you boys, you're just vultures and scavengers. You're here to wreck churches and split them. I trust the young people will take time to find out the cost that our founders of this church paid and that they will appreciate their sacrifice and then rededicate themselves to stand for the same principles. Despite the opposition, the new movement survived and its membership grew, for it had a message that multitudes wanted to hear. Those days were undoubtedly days of revival. You really knew when the gospel was being preached that God was dealing with people. And you came to the meeting expecting to see people saved. You really uh, were wondering, every gospel service, I wonder who will be saved tonight. This church was founded on the word of God. Its message was the gospel of the New Testament, that Christ died for the ungodly, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. I started to attend the Ravenhill Free Presbyterian Church as it was then in the middle 60s. And we look back to great meetings there, the Ulster Hall, where thousands were coming, where many people were attending who had, would say an Ulster never darkened a church door normally and came in to hear the word of God and were converted and changed. And those days, especially in the late 60s, well, I'll never forget them, how God moved so powerfully. And many of my friends were converted in those days. Here was a message of encouragement to believers and of hope for sinners. And the telling of it resulted in some remarkable stories of conversion. The Sunday night came, the place was packed and the appeal was made. I was so convicted that when the appeal was made, when Dr. Paisley asked for a show of hands those who wanted to be saved, I put up my hand without any hesitation. I remember walking up the aisle and into the wee session room. Mr. Paisley came down and he spoke to two of us. There were six in the room at the time and he sat down between another gentleman and myself. I can remember very well 
how he dealt with us, reading from God's word and then praying with us and asking us to say a prayer after him, confessing our sins. After we had prayed, he says, now I want you two gentlemen to confess to each other that you have got saved. And I rose up to my feet and the other man rose up to his feet. All of a sudden, I, when I was shaking hands with him, I realised it was my own father. The Free Presbyterians really did believe the Bible to be the Word of God, verbally inspired by the Holy Spirit and without error. They believed it should be read in daily devotion, trusted from cover to cover, obeyed without reservation and preached in all its fullness. In a word, the secret of the Free Church's ministry is the preaching of Christ according to the Scriptures. We are Reformed, what the world calls Calvinistic, in doctrine and in practice. But that's just another way of saying we preach Christ according to the Scriptures, and without fear, without favour. It is a message that's absolutely degrading to the natural man because it lays him low in the dust but it is absolutely glorifying to God because it says, as Spurgeon used to preach, that salvation is all of grace and all of God. Damnation is all of sin. Uh, that is the secret. Preaching Christ in obedience to the word of God, separation from the world, not just from the ecumenical movement, but the old free Presbyterians lived holy lives, not saying the new ones don't, but I'm saying this is the key, separation unto God in holiness of life, preaching Christ in all his fullness for sinners and all their need. That's what brought us to where we are and that's what will carry us on. The Bible was sufficient for all spiritual and moral teaching. It was the touchstone, the impregnable rock of Holy Scripture, the guidebook, the chart and compass for the journey of life, the final arbiter. We always have men in all ages and, uh, and movements in all ages that stand for the book. And that uh, is where the Free Presbyterian Church will stand. If it doesn't stand for the book, it'll perish. It may go on for years and its churches may decorate sites for the denominational ecclesiastical edifices, but it might as well be out of existence. But free Presbyterians didn't just believe the Bible and proclaim the Bible, they also defended it. When modernists came to town questioning the Bible's infallibility or veracity, free Presbyterians were there to witness against them. Well, of course, it was a protesting church. And uh, the newsletter and the telegraph and the Northern Whig, uh, which then was in vogue, used to say that uh, there was no such a thing as a free Presbyterian church. There was only a few rabble rousers like Paisley and Wiley and a few followers. And uh, no matter where we went, we were browbeaten, we were even spat upon. But we, we made a very, very clear protest. And year after year, we went to the General Assembly and carried posters and we walked round the General Assembly. We stood on the steps and gave out leaflets. And we did this every year. And God blessed our witness, and many joined us. They took on all comers. No modernist or higher critic was safe in Northern Ireland. That is, safe from the protests and examination of free Presbyterians, who questioned their every word and pointed out their every error. Dr Donald Soper, the renowned Methodist preacher, came to Belfast. He denied the infallibility of the Bible, rejected the virgin birth of Christ and repudiated the atoning sacrifice of Calvary. He had to be confronted. We challenged him and uh, exposed his error and uh, he wasn't very happy about it. Uh, he was ready to run, really, and it got so hot that he finally had to close his meeting. 
and we had we had a very wonderful protest and and there's quite a lot of people there who appreciated it although of course there was quite a number who naturally wouldn't appreciate it but god honored us on every protest that we made and added to our church the program that super had on that day included a visit to Ramor Head in the afternoon where he was going to address another open-air meeting. Someone told him that we also were going to Ramor Head. And this, of course, was not true. We went home uh, after the Balamina meeting was finished. But he was under the impression that we were going to Ramor Head uh, and uh, Soper never fulfilled the engagement. And moreover... He has never returned to the shores of Ulster. In 1963, the church even dared to send its moderator and two other ministers, the Reverends John Wiley and John Douglas, into the very citadel of the enemy, to Rome, to the opening of the Second Vatican Council. Churchmen from all over the world, high-ranking churchmen, um, particularly those from ecumenical churches, can't really say from Protestant churches because I cannot hold that they were Protestants uh, going to Rome. But they were non-Catholic churches. They were ecumenical churches. And their representatives were going. Even before they got to Rome, indeed, while still in the air, Mr. Wiley began the witness against falsehood. A prelate of the Church of Rome stood to his feet in the special compartment allocated to churchmen and he said something about the clerical array for everyone was there in clerical attire and he complimented all the brethren who were attending because of their um, their appearance and it was obvious that they were in the church and a voice piped up from the back of that compartment, and this is where we were sitting together, uh, John Wiley saying that um, he was not depending on any piece of uh, religious garb to take him to heaven, but he was depending solely on what Jesus Christ, his Saviour, had done. The gloriously apparelled churchman was stung by Mr Wiley's remark but quickly came back with, you are not over-righteous looking yourself. But Mr. Wiley was not to be outdone. Referring to his own conversion, he said, Sixteen years ago I found that out. Sixteen years ago I found out I was only a wretched, guilty, lost sinner, ready to perish in hell. But I discovered too that Christ became my substitute. He took my place on the tree. And by the shedding of his blood, all my sins were put away. And by trusting uh, upon his work and uh, receiving of his imputed righteousness, I can say, now I have acceptance with God, for I have a perfect righteousness. And with that, uh, the bishop sat down, totally torpedoed. There was silence for the rest of the trip. And when the three ministers arrived in Rome, Mr. Wiley was no less courageous in his promotion of the truth. We went right into the Vatican Square, just facing St. Peter's Basilica. And we had our bags of Bibles and we stood there and we gave these out and they were received most graciously by nuns and uh, friars. I don't know if there's any boilers there or not, but there's a lot of friars there and uh, cardinals. And uh, they all received them with a smile. They weren't used, of course, getting anything from Rome uh, for nothing. But after they took them in and searched them, you see, they realised that this was a Protestant uh, movement and the Swiss Guard was sent out to arrest us. So they came over to us and said, what do you do? And I said, well, we are giving out uh, the scriptures because Papa had posters round Rome and round the whole of Italy at that time. Papa says, read your Bible. And I said, we're giving him Bibles to read. And he shouted, Protestante. I said, it's not Protestante. It is uh, the Bible, the Word of God. He says, we confiscato. 
I said, you do not confiscate all. And we lifted our Bibles and walked over the white line. There's just a white line that separates Rome from the Vatican, you know, and you can just step across and you're outside the jurisdiction of the Vatican. So they couldn't arrest us. So we walked up what is called Reconciliation Street, which leads right down into the Vatican. We went reconciled, of course, and we gave out all our scriptures. These were heady days, stirring times, with constant war being waged against the peddlers of error. But in the midst of the fiercest battles, there was always great joy at the privilege of standing up for King Jesus. In 2010, Free Presbyterians joined with other evangelicals from across Britain to protest at the visit of Pope Benedict to the UK. At meetings in Glasgow and in Edinburgh, men and women rededicated themselves to the cause of the Reformation and to the truth of the Gospel. It's a tremendous experience in that we can look back over those 60 years, see the growth in the church. It's also a very encouraging time in that we're still standing for the same principles. Recently, many of our elders and ministers, the leadership of our denomination met over in Edinburgh actually and rededicated ourselves to the principles of the Free Presbyterian Church. In the mid-1960s, Three ministers were jailed after a protest at the Presbyterian General Assembly. Dr. Paisley, the Reverends John Wiley and Ivan Foster served three months in Crumlin Road Prison for their part in that protest. Having been given permission to march to assembly buildings in the centre of Belfast and to stage a protest there, the police threw a cordon across the road, effectively stopping the march. The police decided to block off the parade in order to allow the moditorial parade of the General Assembly to pass from that building across uh, Howard Street into a neighbouring building where there was a, a meal prepared. Now, they could have been wiser and timed that when we were away somewhere else on that circuit, but instead they threw a rope across just right at the assembly doors where they would walk across Howard Street. The march now became an assembly, and in the eyes of the police, an unlawful assembly. On such fragile grounds, the three men were charged and summoned before the courts. We were charged with unlawful assembly, which we contended was not so, because we had been given permission to march that route by the police, and we had no plans to assemble. We were forced to assemble by the police action in blocking off the road. Our march was brought to a stop, and we instantly became an assembly. And because we had been brought to a stop by the police, we felt we could not be charged with unlawful assembly. But anyway, it was a political thing, and we had to be found guilty. And we were uh, bound over to keep the peace for two years and fined, I think it was about £40. Within a week of the court's judgment, all three men were behind bars. However, this was not the end of the matter. The incident became the catalyst for the greatest surge in growth the Free Church has ever seen. The fact that Dr Paisley and his colleagues were put in prison uh, Terence O'Neill, who was the Prime Minister in them days, uh, and the, the, the Presbyterian Church indeed felt that uh, in order to silence uh, what witness there was in the Free Church and any opposition to the sellout that was being planned at that time and has been taking place since, uh, they thought if they could put this man in prison, uh, silence him, uh, then they would have dealt with any opposition to the political sellout and the ecclesiastical surrender of the truth. All across the country, the anger of the people was stirred up. The prison sentences were seen as political. After all, the charges were flimsy and the evidence falsified. Why should three gospel preachers end up in jail simply for following the voice of conscience? 
as Paul said, the things that have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. And that's the very same thing that happened there. This persecution, rather than, than uh, uh, silencing uh, God's servant, the work never took off until then. In every county and in many towns, rallies were held. People gathered in their thousands. Reports were read from the men in prison and opposition to what had been done to them voiced with vigour. From many parts of the country, the call came for new churches. And over the next five years, some 30 congregations were formed in towns and villages throughout Ulster. These new congregations drew their members from the old, established but spiritually dead churches, where the gospel was little preached and the faith virtually undefended. There was a great stirring amongst the people. And we didn't realise until the congregation was formed that we had people from the Presbyterian Church, we had people from the Church of Ireland, we had Baptist people, we had Brethren people. We had all sorts of people who came. People that had a concern over what had taken place. That in Ulster, this great bastion of Protestantism, where Protestant ministers could be imprisoned for what they believed, that was unthinkable. And people of different religious persuasions got concerned and were stirred up and joined themselves to this work. Gospel preaching wasn't the attractive thing, as we know, uh, for, for young people to be doing in the 60s, but God's presence was so real and so, uh, there, was a very big, there was a very big congregation of young ones uh, in Bellevue that time, and uh, the, the majority was, was young, and it was nice to see uh, older people like my father and that join with them young people because there was, it was in an orange hall. They had no ground, they had no burial ground, they had no facilities of any shape. And for somebody elderly to leave a church and to join that denomination at that time was, was even maybe harder than some of a young person, you know. Yet, despite the hardships, the privations, the apparent future uncertainty, young and old were attracted in ever-increasing numbers to this unstoppable movement and gave it their full support. This increase in membership and in numbers of congregations brought with it other responsibilities. John, we'll have your criticism and then I'll sum up. The church needed more young men to fill the pulpits Thankfully, they came forward, but they had to be properly trained, and that was capably taken care of by Dr. John Douglas, principal of Whitfield College of the Bible. I was asked in, in the summer of 1979 if I would consider the principalship of what was to be called the Whitfield College. Initially, the Whitfield College classes uh, were held in Belfast. Then we came to the college property uh, in Banbridge, the present location for the college. That was 1981. And uh, in Lawrencetown, we have ideal premises for the college. I've often said there with the layout, the spacious grounds, and just the atmosphere of the place, it's, it's ideal for Bible study. Every student coming uh, to our college will be sufficiently far away from it all. Uh, and if ever there's such a thing as having a place conducive to study, well then the present property at Whitfield is uh, calculated to uh, encourage every student to do well in the study programme. In the mid-1970s, 3,000 miles away in the New World, a keen interest in the Free Presbyterian Church was developing. First, in 1976, in Toronto, a retiring minister invited the Reverend Frank McClelland to consider taking over his Bible Presbyterian Church. After deliberation and prayer, the first Free Presbyterian Church in Canada was formed but in the face of fierce opposition. With the maelstrom of opposition that we had, I wasn't sure if there would be 
a welcoming party there for us, maybe news reporters, TV reporters, and that kind of thing. But when I was on the plane, and I'm nervous about flying at the best of times, but the Lord gave me a promise, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And I held on to that promise, and the Lord brought us here safely. We arrived in Toronto, there was no one there, and we made our way to the place that we had rented to, uh, to live in. I was uneasy and frightened, but the Lord overruled and undertook for me. The Lord's protection and provision was evident in every detail of this new church, even when it seemed the whole world was against it. We used to rent a little church on Cosborne Avenue. It was um, rented from the East York School Board, and when they heard that we were coming and were associated with Dr. Paisley, they felt it wouldn't be a good idea to have him preach in a building owned by them, and so they hastily put together a decision to demolish the old church building that we rented in order to make a tennis court. Of course, uh, it was at the behest of some ecumenical leaders this happened. The ecumenical movement, backed up by a bitter and vindictive press, attacked the church, the members, the new minister, and Dr. Paisley. The ecumenical leaders, they always profess to love all, and love all is where you start the tennis match, and uh, they didn't show much love to us. They demolished our building and put us out on the street. But that was the best thing that ever happened, because that caused our people to learn to pray together and to stay together. And God gave us a great promise, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Irish bigots, Toronto venture shocks local clergy, ran the headlines of an article in the Toronto Star. We don't want his church here, say dismayed Protestant leaders, and referring to Frank McClelland, another headline read, Paisley's minister will preach disunity. But the work went ahead. It has grown and prospered and become the mother of many other churches in Canada. Our congregation was the first free Presbyterian church outside Ireland and it was a pioneering adventure for us. And uh, we do look at it as sort of a mother church because from that other churches have started in Canada and it also opened the eyes of the Free Presbyterian Church with regard to going beyond just uh, Canada. So there are several churches now in the United States of America. And I've always felt that uh, Toronto was a, a pivotal place on which the uh, whole work, especially in Canada, would revolve. And we think it's important to have a strong church here that are able to help and succor our daughter churches in Calgary and Vancouver, in Fredericton and Barrie and, and Port Hope in Ontario and so on. And we believe there will be many more in days to come. At almost the same time, the interest spread to the USA and in particular to Greenville, South Carolina, home of the famous Bob Jones University. Dr. Paisley was in contact with Bob Jones University and preached there, and there was therefore quite a lot of interest locally in this phenomenon of a Presbyterian church, reformed in doctrine, and yet separatist and fundamentalist in practice, uh, taking a strong stand against ecumenism and liberalism and things like that. With Dr. Paisley regularly visiting and preaching at the university, and with Let the Bible Speak broadcasting every week, there was quite a bit of interest in the Ulster Church. Later, when Dr. Paisley was with Bob Jones, Dr. Bob said to him, look, there's a group of people in Greenville, they're Presbyterians, but they are separatists, and they can't find uh, an affiliation that really stands up to Presbyterianism and a separatist fundamental Bible-believing position. And so they're an independent Presbyterian church, which they think is an anomaly. So they want to become part of the Free Presbyterian Church. Through Dr. Jones, the people in Greenville sent a letter asking that their congregation be taken under the wing of the Free Presbyterian Church. Dr. Paisley met them and in due course, Faith Free Presbyterian 
became the first congregation in America. We supplied it for a while with men from Northern Ireland. And uh, in 1980, I went there at the beginning of the year, having received the call. I'd first been there in 78 for six weeks, and the Lord had blessed. And I think every week but one, we had a real move of God, and people were saved, and there was just a, a real interest. I had no intention of going back, mind you, but the Lord redirected, and so in 1980, I took up the work and stayed there for about 30 years. The greatest blessing that we've received here uh, is the establishing of the gospel, uh, the reform gospel in my family. Uh, my children are all converted and all have good fruit of going on with the Lord. My wife came to a, a full assurance of faith uh, after we'd been in the, in the free church for a couple of years. So the establishing of the gospel in my family uh, has been the greatest uh, ministry that the Free Church has had uh, with me. Well, in my own experience, um, I had had some doctrinal questions uh, myself, but I wasn't just sure if it was Reformed theology that I was looking for or what I was searching for, but I just was burdened about the condition of the church and even to the condition of the preaching of the church, uh, even among fundamentalists. And when I came to visit the Free Church in Greenville and heard the preaching of Christ, the seriousness with which the pulpit was taken, um, even down really to the atmosphere of the meeting and what the people talked about after the meeting, uh, I knew that there was something there that I had been searching for. And uh, I found in the Free Church that I hadn't seen elsewhere. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, a long-standing interest was still alive and growing, and a small congregation was formed in Newtown Square, near Philadelphia. That work had a, a difficult time to start with. Ivan Foster was there for the constitution of the work, and the Lord blessed his ministry, and uh, people who were saved at that time, one lady, for instance, is still there to this day, God put a stamp upon it, but nonetheless it had a difficult uh, few years. Ultimately, in the early 1980s, I think around 1983, if my memory's right, John Greer went to take up the work. And it was still difficult. But slowly but surely, the Lord began to bless it and build it. The church was extended, and then they moved their premises entirely to a neighboring township, Malvern, where they got a really good church building, and under John's ministry, the church really grew. It was never the plan that the church in Greenville would be a one-off. The people had a greater vision, one that encompassed the whole country. Many of these folk were Bible-believing, separate, fundamentalists, all these things. But they had grown up with a fundamentalism that ticked the boxes. And there was very little theological or doctrinal strength behind it. So when they heard the preaching of Christ and the great doctrines of the faith, allied to an evangelistic zeal and fire, and especially allied to a burden for prayer that they had never found, many of them would have testified they'd never been in a real prayer meeting like this in their lives. They wanted this to spread, and this was the burden of the church. From New Hampshire in the northeast to Arizona in the far west and to many places in between, the message of a pure gospel would be brought by young men burdened for their home region. However, they had to be trained, and in this instance, the church's policy of preparing young men at its theological college in Ulster was just not feasible. So the presbytery agreed that I would set up a theological hall in Greenville. And so in 1982, that program commenced. These men then would go to set up churches where they felt God burdened them for. For instance, Dave Mook 
uh, went to Phoenix because he felt that's where the Lord had burdened him. The book of Ezra is the story of part of that task, the rebuilding of the temple. Over the years, more young men from the USA and Canada have come forward so that today there are some 24 congregations on the North American continent. Ever since believers were first called Christians, they displayed an urgency to spread the good news of salvation to the whole world. The Great Commission, given by the Lord Jesus, is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Various and diverse branches of the church have done this ever since, and the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster is no exception. In 1970, a motion was presented to the Presbytery uh, that there should be the formation of a mission board. There was great concern to see the missionary cause of the church develop. Uh, there were quite a number of young people interested in becoming missionaries. In 1972, that motion became a reality with the Presbytery appointing seven men from the Presbytery. One included the late Reverend Cecil Maneri, who had a particular interest in the work of Spain. We also had three representatives from the Missionary Council and from 1972 to now the Mission Board and the Missionary Council have worked in harmony developing the cause of the missionary endeavour throughout the world and we are very thankful for the many missionaries that have come through uh, the Mission Board. Missionary endeavour has always been a high priority in the church. From the earliest days missionaries were welcomed in every congregation. Reports from overseas were listened to with fascination and generous offerings taken up to support the work in far-off lands. In due course, young people from the church felt the call to foreign service and offered themselves for missionary training. Very soon the first valedictory services were held and the hankies were out on Donegal Quay. As to the strains of God be with you till we meet again, crowds of prayerful well-wishers bade farewell to another young man or woman sailing off down Belfast Loch on the first part of the long journey to a distant land. And what success under God they have had. Schools and medical centres have been built and staffed, lives have been rescued and transformed, and again the message of the gospel has been brought to multitudes who otherwise would never hear. Take Nepal for example. I visited there three years ago. There's a brother there who was converted from being a Hindu and he caught a vision for the, the villages in the mountains where you can only walk to. But he goes into a village and he preaches Christ in them and he has seen people converted and he has seen 60 to 70 congregations commence there. Now that's like apostolic times. Missionaries, supported by gifts and donations from Ulster, are preaching Christ in the regions beyond, to those in spiritual darkness, and often to people living in the most primitive of circumstances. The vast majority of the population in Nepal would be Hindu, and they would have a multitude of gods. But our work is to go in and to preach Christ there. The Bible has been translated into the language. Trinitarian Bible Society have the New Testament, they have the Psalms, of the Proverbs, and these are carried into the mountain villages and they're given out amongst the people. Evangelists go in and they preach. We broadcast in there as well. The Let the Bible Speak radio ministry began in Nepal in uh, September 2006. This was one station being broadcast in English. Now this station itself generated some 300 replies at the very beginning. Now one of the uh, things that the people were asking at that time, can we not have this program in the Nepali language? And so in March 2007, we began to broadcast in the Nepali language when Paul Thapa, uh, national in Nepal, 
he translated English programs into Nepali and he began to broadcast in their own language. Now this has generated a tremendous response. Thousands of people have written in asking more about the gospel. Everyone who writes in receives from Paul a new beginning booklet uh, translated into Nepali and this gives the people an understanding of the gospel. In Africa, where many churches have been pursuing missionary endeavour for generations, the Free Presbyterian Church teamed up with the Bible Christian Faith Church. This has been a most satisfactory arrangement and has brought great rewards. In many aspects of missionary work, we follow other people's labours. And in regard to our work in Kenya, we are so thankful for the ministry of uh, Miss Margaret Armstrong. Margaret became a member of our Arma congregation as a result of her understanding of the ecumenical movement and her desire for a separated testimony. She had worked for quite a number of years with the African Inland Mission uh, involving the Kendergore family, and that was the contact that we had originally made uh, with the work there in West Bucott. Uh, when George McConnell and myself were sent out by Presbytery to look at the work in Kenya, we returned and presented it to the college and to the Presbytery. As a result, Miss Margaret Russell uh, felt called of God to go out to Kenya, and she was the first of quite a number of missionaries to make her way to that part of Africa. So we do thank God for the memory of uh, Miss Armstrong and are very grateful for the input that she made to our missionary cause. I think the jewel in our missionary crown must be the Christian Academy in Kenya. We commenced to build that in 1998 and we opened it last year, 2009. Now, we raised about 800 to 900,000 pounds to build that. Started with about 20 children, 15,000 pounds for the first few classrooms. Now we have a massive school building there and almost 700 children. And the remarkable thing about it is that no other department of the missionary work suffered because of the money being raised for the school in Kenya. In Spain, a modern European country rich in history, culture, art and religion, Free Presbyterian missionaries have ministered for over 30 years. The Reverend John Hanna leads a thriving congregation in Alcorcón, a large town near the Spanish capital, Madrid. Whilst almost 200 miles south, amongst the olive groves of Cortillos Nuevos, the Reverend Lyle Boyd ministers to another growing assembly of believers, and there are new churches developing in other parts of Spain. However, the work of God cannot stand still. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, is the Lord's injunction. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Today, the harvest fields are vast, and they are white unto harvest. So, what of the future? My hope for that is that we will see more young people call from all our churches. The world is wide open, fields are wide open for missionaries to go into. Our missionaries can't go on. We have missionaries coming up to retirement. They must retire. I must retire. But I'm hoping and praying that the Lord will raise up more young people to go out. And that will come if there's a vision in the pulpit. If the ministers have a missionary heart, you'll find that our people will get the vision as well. And the work will go on. If our church ever loses the vision for missionary work, 
then it will be a reflection of a loss of vision in the home church. And I can but only implore in this, our 60th anniversary, all of our churches to redouble their effort in terms of our missionary commitments, recognizing that we do have a responsibility, first and foremost, to the missionaries that we send out to the mission field. And I trust that over the next number of years, we will see a very big a uh, number of people, young people from our churches, showing even now a greater interest in the missionary work. We're very grateful for all those who have gone out. They have left us a great legacy, and I trust that that legacy will enrich our church for many, many years to come. And all our congregation, we have a host of young people and I'm delighted to see them. And when I look back at my own life and see the way I came and see the way some of these young people are coming on, I wonder why the Lord even used me. Because I think we have a great reserve of young people coming on. And uh, I trust that we'll see many of them on the mission field. They'll be able to do far more than ever we did. I hope that you'll stay with us for the next quarter hour as we Let the Bible Speak. Since 1973, when Let the Bible Speak was founded and began broadcasting over one small radio station on the Isle of Man, it has grown to encompass the globe. Today, its programs are heard on dozens of radio stations, reaching every continent and reaching people as no other medium can do. We can bring the gospel right into their homes or even into their place of work. And certainly the response that we have received worldwide uh, indicates very clearly that uh, the Lord has blessed this outreach and many, many souls have come to saving faith in Christ. Now another result of the radio broadcast is that Paul Thapa has had to send a number of men into the villages to make contact with these people. One young man, Tulsi by name, went in the month of June 2010. He began his work in the middle of that month and in a few weeks he had somewhere in the region of five churches established as a result of the radio broadcast. At home too, the need to bring the gospel to an ever more secular world is increasingly evident. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. To remove the blindfolds, to dispel the darkness, the church must respond with the only weapon it has, the light of the gospel. This was what inspired one of the most adventurous evangelistic efforts of recent years, the Consider Christ campaign. Well, back in February time of 2009, we decided that this year is the 150th anniversary of the 1859 revival. Back then, we were aware that a minister, J. H. Moore in Connor, in the Presbyterian Church, had challenged four of his more promising young men about doing something more for God. And we thought, given the fact we're now in the anniversary year, that it would be good if we reissued that challenge and encouraged our people, young people, old and everyone in between, to do something more for God this year. We reckoned that if we could get people to stop in their everyday activity and for a moment or two pause and bring all thoughts into focus around the person and work of Jesus Christ, that they would not only consider him, of course, but come to him. We thought also of the words of John the Baptist, that herald of the gospel and signpost to Jesus who cried, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So working on those two words as our main theme, we were taking the thought in a world without direction. Uh, Jesus is the way. In a world without certainty, Jesus is the truth. And in a world without hope, Jesus is the life. And that, of course, was based upon the words of Christ. In John 14, in verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
And we used that particular text as the standard text in all of our advertising. They consider Christ Project is an ongoing one. Just as each new generation needs the gospel message, so each new generation of believers needs to follow the obligation of Christ's command to go and teach all nations. It's good that we are a missionary-minded church, reaching out to the lost and the world around about us. It's also good that we're an evangelistic church, reaching out in our own province and also into the south of Ireland with special campaigns. But there's a very special group of individuals that God has put into our immediate care, and that is the children of God's people. Every Christian parent has a duty before God to bring their children up in the fear and in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. And with that in mind, we have Sabbath schools, we have children's meetings, we run youth fellowships for our children and our young people. But one of the most effective means of safeguarding our children is the Christian school movement. A Christian school safeguards a child from a whole raft of pernicious influences. A matter of prime importance is that the children are delivered from the immorality and the influences of uh, a very corrupt society in the state school sector today. They're not subject to the influences that are there, influences to drink, influences to take drugs, influences to indulge in immoral behaviour. They also are taught uh, from a biblical perspective all the subjects on the school curriculum and they're taught the falsehood of evolution and it gives a great opportunity to give them a good grounding in the teachings of the Bible in every aspect of life. A Christian education is not a lesser education by any means. The pupils that come through our schools get the very best of results in GCSE examinations and also those schools that do A-levels get very high grades as well that enable our pupils to go on to further education if that's what they desire. We've had pupils that have gone on to university, even university like Cambridge, and certainly that would indicate that it's not a lesser education. And also it's encouraging that when they do go to university that they are enabled to stand for the Lord. And hopefully the influence that they have had during their days in a Christian school will stand them in good stead in their later life. The Presbyterian Church was immersed in prayer from its very beginning. All the founding fathers were men of prayer. Indeed, it may be said that it was as a result of one notable prayer meeting that the church was born. One of the high points in the church was a time of prayer that we had one night in our old church. And uh, there was four of us met and we prayed all night and all day the next day, all the next night and right into the next day and uh, God poured out a spirit upon us. And from that day to this day, uh, this Raven Hill Road has seen scores and scores and scores of people converted. Having begun with such protracted, fervent, prevailing seasons of prayer, they became the pattern for the future. No decision was taken, no battle was fought, no enterprise considered without prayer being made. In every mission, for example, as well as in regular church services, there was the backup of all nights of prayer. And I believe those all nights of prayer gave a distinctive characteristic to the meetings. I know as the appeal was being made Sunday night after Sunday night amidst much prayer from the floor of the congregation, it seemed as if souls were being born out of prayer as the preacher made the appeal. It was more like the evangelist as well as the minister making the appeal, the minister being himself the evangelist every Sunday night. The 
prayer meeting was often billed as the most important service of the week and attracted large attendances and enthusiastic participation. So important is prayer to the church that at the beginning of each new year, all the ministers and many of the elders come together for a week to lay the burdens of the church before the Lord in prayer. Many will attest to the blessings and benefits which have flowed from these special seasons of intercession. To sum up 60 years of the Church's history is not easy. So much has happened over those 60 years, much more than can be recorded here. We pay tribute to the Founding Fathers, those men and women who launched out into the unknown deep, trusting their future to the God of all grace and in his promise to never leave nor forsake. We give honour to all those who down through the years have stood by the stuff, proved themselves in the heat of battle, remained faithful and supported the cause of truth. We give thanks for those who are in the church today and encourage them to continue this vital witness. The battle is not yours but God's and no matter what opposition comes today, tomorrow or in the future, God has promised his help. In one of his darkest hours, Martin Luther took encouragement from the words of Psalm 46, and it was the inspiration for his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The metrical version, which has echoed in free Presbyterian meetings for 60 years, assures the church on earth that God in the midst of her doth dwell, nothing shall her remove. The Lord to her and helper will, and that right early prove. promise given to one of the church's most beloved founding fathers, Sandy Macaulay of Cabra, now Balamoney, was, though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. That promise has been wonderfully fulfilled. God most certainly came down, and to him be the praise, the honour and the glory. For us who have lived through these momentous and blessed times, we rehearse from our hearts the benediction of the psalmist. Blessed is the man whom thou dost choose and makest approach to thee, that he within thy courts, O Lord, may still a dweller be. We surely shall be satisfied with thy abundant grace and with the goodness of thy house even of thy holy place. <laughs>